Okay. Well, it's 401. Okay, so I guess we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Zarotka, for those of you who I haven't met. I'm a PhD student with Carol Chambers, and I study the hibernation ecology and physiological ecology of an endangered jumping mouse, which is how I became interested in some of the broad work of Dr. Corey Williams, our speaker today, who has um, studied extensively hibernating Arctic ground squirrels in Alaska. Uh, Dr. Williams completed his undergrad degree at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, completed his PhD at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where he studied the trophic ecology of tufted puffins, and, um, which he did with Dr. Lauren Buck, who's faculty here at NAU in the biology department and also one of my committee members. Um, and Dr. Williams did postdocs at the University of Alaska Anchorage on Arctic ground squirrels and the University of Alberta with red squirrels before becoming a research, uh, research assistant professor at NAU for two years. Um, and then he held a tenure track assistant professor position at the University of Alaska Fairbanks for four years before he came back to the lower 48 where he is now at Colorado State University since um, this fall. Um, research in the Williams lab combines molecular, physiological, ecological, and evolutionary approaches to advance our understanding on the causes and consequences of climate-driven shifts in timing, with a second research focus on better understanding how trophic adaptations affect species interactions um, with climate change. So to speak um, more about this uh, and some of his current research, please welcome Dr. Corey Williams. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for the introduction, Jen, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming today. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, speak with you all uh, about some of my work on uh, Arctic raptor trophic ecology. And so uh, the talk today is really going to focus on this TDF CAM approach. And so TDF stands for trophic discrimination factor. And the CAM is for cameras. And so essentially we've been developing a method of using Nest cameras to uh, calculate trophic discrimination factors for Bayesian stable isotope mixing models. And my screen's stuck, so, okay, there we go. So I'm gonna sort of start at the back here and uh, go with acknowledgements first. And the reason I wanted to do this is because really everything I'm gonna talk about today was spearheaded by my former PhD student, uh, Devin Johnson. And so, uh, you know, really all the kudos for this work is uh, go to him and I've kind of been uh, just along for the ride. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge our, my collaborators, uh, David Johnson at uh, the Peregrine Fund and Travis Booms at Alaska Department of Fish and Game. So none of this would have been possible without this sort of collaborative enterprise. So as I'm sure uh, everyone watching today is well aware, uh, global change is happening and then it's happening rather rapidly. And uh, when we think about climate change, uh, one thing to keep in mind is everything that's happening is happening much more rapidly in that Arctic environment. So these uh, figures here are from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, from that latest report. And uh, it's just showing uh, the uh, projected warming uh, under different scenarios. So how much the globe is gonna warm uh, is uh, dependent on these different models. So with 1.5 degrees uh, of warming, you can see that the Arctic is actually going to be warming uh, much more than that. So looking at four or five degrees and with a more extreme scenario of uh, four degrees, you can see that that's going to mean seven, eight degree uh, temperature increases in that Arctic environment. And I should also point out that the likelihood that we're going to only have 1.5 degrees of global warming is pretty low at this stage. So we're, we're looking at uh, pretty dramatic changes to these Arctic environments. Associated with this, we're also seeing changes in precipitation. 
Uh, part of this is because as you uh, reduce the amount of sea ice that's there, you increase evapotranspiration and you end up uh, with higher levels of precipitation. So while some regions of the globe are gonna get drier under climate change, uh, the Arctic in general is gonna become uh, a wetter environment. And uh, we often talk about climate change as something that's projected to happen or it's going to happen, uh, but things are already really warming rather rapidly uh, in this Arctic environment. So this is uh, depicting uh, the change from uh, 2013 to 2017 uh, versus the, the 50s through the 1970s. So in this Arctic environment, uh, that mean temperature is you know, three to four degrees uh, higher already. And associated with that, we're seeing things like uh, the loss of sea ice. So this top left figure shows that the sea ice extent in November in 1978, and you can compare that to 2016. So these, these regions that are shown in white and that are not blue, there used to be ice, and there no longer is uh, ice in November. And so that can have uh, pretty big uh, changes, particularly in, in those uh, coastal environments. Uh, in terrestrial environments, uh, we're seeing permafrost warming, and in some cases, uh, permafrost thaw. And when you get thaw, you get these uh, really um, obvious signs of, of climate change. Additionally, something that you see uh, across much of the Arctic is shrubification. So these uh, tundra tussock regions are transforming into low shrub regions. And so it's really changing that uh, environment. So I'm interested in um, Arctic change in general. And uh, as Jen mentioned, a lot of my work has focused on Arctic ground squirrels and, and studying their uh, physiological and ecological responses to climate change. Uh, but I've also become more interested in uh, the ecosystem in general and what's happening to upper trophic level predators, uh, such as gyro falcon, golden eagle, and rough-legged hawks. But to really get a handle on uh, what's happening to these species, we need some really basic information on their biology, uh, such as what are these animals eating? So we, we have these three animals here that I'm gonna focus on today, and they're all cliff nesting raptors. They occur in the same region. And so presumably they're partitioning the resources up in that environment, uh, but how are they doing that? And we need to know that for some baseline data to look at how the ecosystem changes are subsequently affecting them. So the work I'm talking about today all happened up on the, the Seward Peninsula in Northwestern uh, Alaska. And in terms of doing the field research, uh, the nice thing about the Seward Peninsula is that off of Nome here, you have a bit of a road system, which is depicted in red. And that means we can get to these raptor sites uh, relatively easily. So uh, in, in uh, spring, uh, we do surveys with helicopters. Uh, so it's Alaska Department of Fish and Game doing those. And then we can go out in trucks and access those uh, cliffs uh, by just walking across the tundra to get to them. And uh, when this project started, we had sort of two kind of big questions that we were interested in answering. One of those was, how do uh, the, this raptor guild, how do they partition resources uh, among species? So how is uh, the diet uh, of gyro falcons, golden eagles, and rough-legged hawks different from one another? And how much overlap is there? And how does that change under different environmental conditions? We're also interested in this niche partitioning uh, within a species because a population can be made up of many generalists that have a very similar niche, or it can be made up of many specialists that have uh, very different niches. The second question we are interested in is how this uh, trophic niche changes across time. So uh, in the Arctic environment, um, these raptors, uh, well, at least the gyro falcon and the rough-legged hawk are known to consume uh, arvicoline rodents, so these are the voles and lemmings, and they vary substantially in their abundance across time. So they, they go through these population cycles where they'll be booming, and then 
for the next couple of years, they'll be very low and then they'll boom again. So there's these short boom or bust cycles. And we're interested in whether when the, the, there are more prey available in the system because there's more arvicolon rodents, if you see a niche expansion by the various species happening through increased specialization. So I'll talk about this a little bit more in the talk with some, some figures so that you can wrap your heads around it a little bit more. But a population can expand its trophic niche either by having all the individuals within the population expand that niche or by having increased specialization where you have different individuals within the population specializing on different things. So how do we get at this kind of data? Well, uh, one way you can do this is by putting up uh, these uh, nest cameras. And they're nice because they record every prey delivery to the nest. And uh, they're also not nice because they record everything that's happening at the nest. So you end up with millions of photos and it's pretty onerous uh, to go through those. So uh, uh, my uh, PhD student uh, went through millions of photos for this project alone. And uh, these cameras were put up uh, as part of the Peregrine Sponge uh, Geer Falcon project. So they're really interested in Geer Falcon because they're projected to be vulnerable to climate change. Uh, this is showing their um, Arctic distribution. And if you look at this map, it's a really confusing map to look at. You need like five minutes to resolve it. Uh, but the main thing to look at is this, this orange color here for the distribution of Geer Falcon when they're not with rock ptarmigan or willow ptarmigan, and you never see that. So geer falcon are always co-occurring with some sort of ptarmigan, and they're generally ptarmigan specialists. And uh, so because they're a specialist in that Arctic environment, which is warming, they're, they're projected to be uh, more vulnerable. So you can put these nest cameras up and, you know, see what they're feeding on. So th this shows an Arctic ground squirrel here. We've got a long-tailed Jaeger. I uh, kind of can't see that one very well here, but uh, it's a ptarmigan. And then we've got a, uh, a collared lemming that's uh, being brought in. So you go through all of the photos and identify them and use estimates of mass to get the proportional uh, diet estimate. So that was great to address our question. Uh, so we've got all this data for Geo Falcon, but unfortunately we, we don't have nest cameras up uh, for Golden Eagle and Rough-Legged Hawk. So that doesn't really allow us to get at these questions in terms of what's happening in, in niche partitioning uh, within that raptor guild. However, in addition to putting up the nest cap cameras, uh, these, um, uh, Geer falcon uh, nestlings uh, at 25 days of age were taken from the nest, they were uh, weighed and measured, and they took blood samples uh, for hormone analyses. So when they did that, they also kept all of the red blood cells, and we can use those uh, for stable isotope analysis. And uh, just fortunately, Alaska Department of Fish and Game had some other projects going with golden eagles and rough-legged hawks where they also collected uh, blood samples and had kept um, uh, red blood cells on hand. So now we have a, a measure to uh, assess uh, niche partitioning, but how can we do that? So to get at that, uh, I need to introduce you to uh, stable isotopes and uh, what they are. And essentially the concept here is uh, you are what you eat. So uh, the, the stable isotopes in your diet and all of the elements of your diet are gonna become incorporated into your tissues. And so we can depict a human here as uh, being corn because we've got this strong corn signal. Corn's a, a, a C4 plant. So very different from uh, most plants. So 95% of plants are C3 plants. That C4 plant has a, a distinct isotopic signature and that's transmitted to people. And even if you're feeding on you know, cattle or uh, chicken, they're also fed a lot of corn. So that's passed to them and then passed up to us. So that's the general sort of concept of stable isotope analysis. 
So what is a stable isotope? So if we look at uh, any elements such as uh, nitrogen 14 here, we can see it's made up of its electrons. And then you've got the, the protons and neutrons. And the vast majority of nitrogen in the environment is in this form, nitrogen 14. But there's a tiny, tiny fraction that has an extra neutron. So it's slightly heavier and we can measure that. And uh, it's stable. So that's why we call it a stable isotope. So it's not decaying like a radioactive isotope and it has no charge difference. Uh, so it behaves very much the same way uh, that nitrogen 14 does. And when we talk about it, we use this notation of, of delta 15N. And this is simply uh, the ratio of nitrogen 15 to nitrogen 14 relative to some standard. And the reason it's always relative to some standard is because the, the fraction here is really tiny. So if we were talking per mil, you'd be, you know, 0. 0.0000, you know, one, five de de decimal points out there. And we don't want to do that. So we just do it relative to a standard. So when you look at the numbers, they're kind of arbitrary because the chosen standards are, are pretty arbitrary. So how do we use a uh, stable isotope? So I'm, I'm going to restrict it here to carbon and nitrogen. And so we've got carbon here on the y-axis with that delta 15N. And you can see uh, nitrogen on, on the y-axis with delta 15N. And if you go from your, your plant to your herbivore, it's going to increase in delta 15N. Uh, due to physiological um, biochemical processes. And if you go from that herbivore to the carnivore, it's going to increase again. So you get this increase with trophic level. And the general rule of thumb is three parts per mil, but uh, it varies a lot depending on uh, the taxa that you're looking at and uh, physiological state. In terms of carbon, it's often used for looking at terrestrial versus a marine environment. So most terrestrial environments are going to be C3 dominant, and then um, you have higher uh, delta 13C with that marine environment. It's also done with that C3 versus C4 that I talked about before. So the, the humans that are eating only corn and things that feed on corn are going to have this strong C4 signature. So you can get this general um, you know, trophic level and marine versus terrestrial um, sort of signatures out there. Uh, but often we want more detail than that. Can we actually estimate diet composition using um, stable isotopes? And so this has been done for quite a while now using uh, stable isotope mixing models. And so here you'd have your uh, prey, such as um, your ground squirrel, your ptarmigan, and this is going to be an insectivorous bird. And you can see they, ha they have distinct isotopic signatures. And so your predator is going to have some signature um, that falls um, somewhere within this triangle. So if it fell exactly here, you could use mass balance equations to calculate how much of each um, prey type it was feeding on. And this would give you 50% ptarmigan and 50% ground squirrel. Whereas if it fell over here, that would give you 45% ptarmigan, 45% insectivorous songbird, and 10% uh, ground squirrel. Okay, so that seems really simple and easy and great, but of course everything is more complicated in reality, and you're not exactly what you eat, right? There's these processes associated uh, with the assimilation of the diet and the incorporation into tissues and these biochemical processes. That means you're not exactly what you eat. And so often that, that value is actually not even going to fall within this triangle. And uh, we have to account for this assimilation of the isotopes into the tissue of interest. And so we do that using trophic discrimination factors. So uh, for example, we could have a trophic discrimination factor of one for car carbon and a trophic discrimination factor of two for nitrogen. And then we account for this. And this gives us what the animal actually ate in terms of the isotopic value. And then we use those same mass balance equations to calculate uh, the diet. So in this case, 50% ptarmigan, 50% ground squirrel. So one limitation of this approach using these um, classic um, stable isotope mixing models is that you can 
only have one more source uh, than the number of isotopes you're using in the model. So to have additional sources, you then need to have additional isotopes, or you can use uh, other um, statistical approaches um, such as Bayesian mixing models, which I'll get to in a minute. Okay, so we've got these trophic discrimination factors for carbon and nitrogen. How do we calculate those? So you, you need those for your mixing models to work. How are we gonna calculate them? So the best ways that to date has been used um, was devised by people like Keith Hobson back in the uh, 80s and uh, early 90s uh, using controlled feeding studies. So you do something like feed nothing but uh, ptarmigan to your predator. And you do that for long enough that the tissue of interest has fully turned over. And then you'll measure that tissue of interest. In this case, we're interested in red blood cells. And you compare that to uh, the uh, ptarmigan. Uh, and that will give you uh, the um, fractionation factor. So that the also called delta 15 n, which is a little confusing, of two parts per mil in this case. You can also do a controlled feeding study where you're not just feeding one prey type, but you're feeding multiple prey types, as long as you know how much of each prey type you're feeding, because they're going to have slightly different isotopic values. And you can con control for that in your math, essentially, and calculate your um, trophic discrimination factor in the same way that you would do if you're feeding them only one prey type. Okay, but as I mentioned before, uh, you're restricted with classic stable isotope mixing models uh, to having only three sources if you're using um, two isotopes. However, the development of Bayesian stable isotope mixing models allows you to still estimate uh, diets uh, for your predator. In this case, the predator is uh, a goose and, and they're different um, grasses and zostera and uh, other um, plants that are being consumed, and you can estimate diet. In this case, the estimate won't give you an, an exact point, but it'll give you a, a density um, plot, essentially. And so not surprisingly for these geese here, they are close to that zostera signature. The, the model uh, projects that they're feeding mostly on that uh, zostera. The other nice thing about these Bayesian stabilized stoke mixing models is they allow you to include variance in your estimate of your trophic discrimination factor into the model and that propagates into your estimates. So that all sounds uh, great, uh, but then you get papers like this that come out and this came out uh, right near the start of uh, Devin's PhD. And it's uh, the title um, pretty much tells the story. Stabilized tote mixing models fail to estimate the diet of an avian predator. So they ran Bayesian stabilized tote mixing models and they did not match uh, what they knew the diet was from their camera studies. On the other hand, a, another paper came out uh, slightly uh, a year later and they found that Bayesian stable isotope models can accurately assess the diet of wild animals. And this was, a, again, a study in raptors. Uh, in this case, it was common buzzards. And um, they, um, they used a very similar method to the other paper. So what's going on here? Why is one study showing that things work great and another study showing that, well, they don't work very well at all? And the answer likely relates uh, to this. So this is a, a great study uh, that was done uh, by Alex Bond and Tony Diamond um, about a decade ago, showing that these isotopic mixing models are very sensitive to variation in your trophic discrimination factors. And so if you're using the wrong trophic discrimination factor, it's not gonna work well for your isotope mixing model. And often it's very difficult to acquire these mixing models. So I said before, you can conduct a captive study where you feed a diet and then get your trophic discrimination factor. 
Uh, but that's not logistically feasible to do that for every species. Uh, and so often you'll use a trophic discrimination factor from the literature and apply that to your system. And if you haven't chosen that well, that can create issues. So uh, when Devin was thinking about his project and what this meant, you know, we were looking at the literature for these trophic discrimination factors. And, you know, essentially those two studies were using kind of similar trophic discrimination factors. And there, there wasn't one for Girofalcon. So the question was, well, what should we use? And so we thought, well, perhaps the best way to move forward is to actually create our own trophic discrimination factor for nestling Girofalcon from our own study. And to use, instead of, doing a captive study where we feed known amounts of diet to the, the bird. We'll use estimates from the nest cameras that are known and use that in the same math as you would do for a captive study and calculate trophic discrimination factors. So uh, this is what we did. We uh, had these 25 year old um, gyro falcons uh, that we had blood samples from. We have uh, muscle tissue samples from 185 prey. And then we use two nests to calculate um, trophic discrimination factors as our starting point. Uh, one nest had uh, been fed primarily uh, ptarmigan, uh, which is kind of what you'd expect for this species. But another nest had been fed primarily um, uh, Arctic ground squirrels. And so we use those and, and then we calculated diets for all of the other nests that we had nest camera data on uh, using those trophic discrimination factors. So uh, this shows uh, the, um, the different sources in our model. So we've got um, five potential um, prey species. And when I say species, it's not just species. So this is like all our Vicolan rodents are lumped together here. We can't differentiate between you know, voles and lemmings. Uh, they're so close in their isotopic signature. And so they're pooled into one group. And uh, these were the trophic discrimination factors that we calculated uh, for those uh, two nests. And I've just shown those in red. And all of these other trophic discrimination factors are from prior um, captive studies. So the peregrine study as adult peregrine that were fed. And then we have condor, snowy owl. And then the cider one is actually not a captive study. It was a um, R package that was developed by Healy et al. And what that R package does is considers the taxonomy of um, your predator and pulls from all potential um, um, controlled feeding studies to, to calculate the best um, uh, trophic discrimination factor. So slightly different, but we, we tested the effect, efficacy of the TDF cam approach versus all of these captive feeding approaches. And uh, this is what we found. So uh, we'll start at sort of the bottom of this figure. We've got a uh, camera diet. So this is gonna be the same diet across it all because it's the same set of cameras. So this is the known diet for these other nests. And then above that is the calculated diet from a Bayesian stable isotope mixing model using the, um, the trophic discrimination factor that's listed above. So for the peregrine TDF, you can see that it's estimating that they fed on almost nothing but ptarmigan, uh, but that's not reality. And so you end up with a lot of bias towards ptarmigan at the and negative bias towards all of the other species. So that was essentially true for all of these other trophic discrimination factors. So if we just used those and applied those, they wouldn't have worked very well at all, similar to that initial peregrine study. But when we use our TDF cam approach, uh, we got very good um, uh, similarity between that the diet estimated by the Bayesian stabilized mixing model and the camera diet. And so this is population wide. And again, this Bayesian stable isotope mixing model, we're showing the, the peak density estimates, um, but really, you know, 
you can't say much certainty. It's just hard to depict the certainty in this particular graphic. The other thing you can look at are these uh, Bhattacharya's uh, coefficients. So you can think of those as being similar to an R squared value. It's comparing um, the similarity of two proportions. And so higher, closer to one is better. You can see that the TDF CAM approach uh, did much better than all of these other uh, approaches. So that looked really good in terms of estimating the population-wide um, diet. But when you looked at individual nests, it's not quite as good as we would like. Um, so here it's showing the correlation between that, the diet uh, from the nest cameras and the diet from the mixing models. And um, you can see that each one of these points here is an individual nest. So you can do a pretty good job of predicting that it's going to be a low ptarmigan nest versus a high ptarmigan make a nest, but you're not going to get um, exact numbers there. Uh, and it does uh, somewhat poorly with the, the um, species that are, occur in, in low percentage. So uh, the conclusion from that was that these Bayesian stabilized stoke mixing models effectively characterize uh, the diet of an Arctic raptor. So we didn't want to just stop there, however. We thought, well, We've shown that this works really well in this system with GR Falcon, but there's these other two studies that have already happened uh, in um, Peregrine and in uh, common buzzards, and they had very different results. And we thought, well, what would happen if we applied this um, TDF CAM approach to those studies? Can we actually improve the estimates? And the other question we had was, well, we, we selected two nests kind of at random to calculate our TDF CAM approach. But I'm not really sure that's the best way to do it because you could, you know, randomly pick, you know, not two nests that are kind of outliers and then you would potentially end up with, with issues. So we we're interested in understanding how many nests do you actually need to accurately um, identify a, a, a trophic discrimination factor. But the, the issue we have is that the cameras are used to calculate the TDF cam, and then we are using the cameras to validate the method as well. So what we did was for all of these three studies, for each nest, we calculated the TDF cam from all other nests, and then calculated the diet using the Bayesian mate stabilized stoke mixing model from, from all of those other nests. And then we repeated that process um, iteratively for every nest in the population. So uh, jumping into the results here, uh, the first thing that uh, Devin did was a sensitivity analysis. Uh, so this is uh, essentially using a, a bootstrapping approach. And really he wanted to get at how many nests do you need to really reduce the variance as much as uh, possible. And so uh, this is again showing uh, your, your density plots uh, for your TDFs in this case. And you can see um, they're actually fairly narrow, which is really good. And they narrow quite quickly. So in, in this study, really seven or eight nests, uh, you're getting a, a pretty accurate um, estimate of your TDF. Now you can see these red lines depicted here. This is the TDF that was um, developed using those two nests. So it gives you an idea that you can be off a little bit if you just only use two nests because the variance is a little bit high uh, in that case. So one thing to keep in mind for this Jeer Falcon data set is we had almost 26 day camera days per nest. So basically from hatch right up until we took the blood sample, we have uh, complete camera coverage during that entire period of turnover. So next, let's look at the common buzzard data. So uh, if you notice going from, from the Jeer Falcon to the common buzzard, everything got, gets a little bit wider here in terms of, of our estimates of uh, TDFs. And uh, part of this we think is associated with the fact that 
um, they're much more variable in terms of the number of camera days uh, that they have uh, per nest. Uh, regardless, if you look at the TDF, you get out to, to nine to 10 uh, nests, you're getting a pretty good estimate of your, um, of your TDF. Um, but because the, the resolution is not quite as good, it's not quite as good for the common buzzard. So let's look at uh, how that um, affected the diet estimates. And um, actually, I'm not going to talk about the feather and the plasma, which is shown in the middle and the left. So just uh, on the right, just concentrate on the, the left hand side for now. Uh, and look at the, the common buzzard. This is red blood cell. This was the best model from this common buzzard study. And you can see that they're overestimating uh, this is mice uh, being fed to the common buzzards uh, using uh, that cider approach. And uh, you can see that in their, their mean estimates um, from their Bayesian stable isotope mixing model compared to the camera diet. Whereas when we use the, the TDF cam approach, uh, we have a, a higher um, Bhattacharya's uh, coefficient and we don't have that uh, same level of, of bias and we get a, a accurate, uh, quite an accurate estimate of diet. So we're overestimating amphibians um, a little bit. Uh, but doing pretty well. So if you're concerned about the circularity of using the cameras in this study for both calculating the TDF cam and for um, looking at the results, we also decided to look and see what the GeoFalcon TDF cam um, uh, trophic discrimination factors from that study and applied them to this study. And you can see that our Bhattacharya's coefficient here is not as good as within the study, but it's still much better than these prior ones uh, that they used. Um, and this was the study where they determined that stable isotope mixing models effectively characterize diet. So let's look at the Peregrine study. And there they found that they didn't effectively characterize diet. So we've gotten even wider here in terms of our um, estimates uh, for uh, the trophic discrimination factors. You can see that the, the intervals are extremely wide here for a low number of nests. And even when you get out to, to 10 nests, this is, is a little bit wider than we would ideally want, uh, but it, it does pretty well. You can see this red line here is uh, depicting uh, the peregrine trophic discrimination factor. And so they used in this peregrine study a species-specific trophic discrimination factor, but it's way different from what our TDF cam estimates. And the reason for this is that captive study utilized adults. And adults are going to differ substantially from nestlings in terms of trophic discrimination. And the reason for this is that when you're rapidly growing, you become much less efficient in the use of your nitrogen. And that will result in a lower trophic discrimination factor. And so you're seeing that uh, here. Not sure why you're also seeing a, a difference in uh, carbon, but I suspect it also relates to differences in the physiology between a rapidly growing nestling and an adult. So it's not just species that's important. So these intervals uh, that we had for the TDF cam are quite wide, but you see that they only had 8.5 camera days per nest. Their lowest number was two camera days per nest. Uh, and using these cameras, there's 20% of their prey deliveries that couldn't be identified, which is really quite high. So this is not an ideal situation. There was also an issue with the, the cameras being uh, deployed at the time of blood sampling, which meant they sampled diet after the period of isotopic incorporation. So if the diets shifted across time, that would uh, result in uh, increased error as well. Uh, even so, with the uh, trophic discrimination factor built using the cameras, uh, we were able to improve the diet estimates. So we correctly identify insectivorous birds as the primary prey source, although you can see that 
we're estimating they're consuming a lot of waterfowl, which is, is not the case, uh, but it's better estimates than they originally had from that um, uh, peregrine uh, study. Uh, additionally, this uh, study used uh, plasma. So we took the uh, common buzzard uh, plasma TDF cams and applied them to this. And uh, they also uh, worked um, better than uh, the top model from the original uh, study. So again, a sign that you really shouldn't use adult uh, trophic discrimination factors and apply them to juveniles. Uh, so what can we take uh, away from this? Uh, well, what's important for TDF cams, you wanna have as high a coverage as you can, can for those cameras um, that covers the entire period of isotopic incorporation. And um, you also want to try not to have a lot of variability in terms of when those cameras are out. So we had them out zero to 25 days and sampled all the animals at the same age. Whereas here it was a lot more variable in terms of when the cameras were out and how old the nestlings were when they were sampled. And uh, again, placement of cameras is really important. So 20% unidentifiable prey versus 0.7% of unidentifiable prey. And the other conclusion we can take from this section is that uh, perhaps it's okay, it's not ideal to use a, um, a trophic discrimination factor from a, another species, uh, but you're probably better off to use another similar um, life history stage animal uh, different species rather than to try and apply an adult trophic discrimination factor to a juvenile because growth is really going to affect um, discrimination of stable isotopes. Okay, so now we can move on to part three, which is getting back to those original questions we had within that Arctic Raptor Guild. So can we uh, look at foraging niche partitioning uh, between and within species? and then understand how uh, the trophic niche of these uh, raptors uh, changes across time. In particular, addressing this question of uh, whether niche expansion at the population level is driven by increased specialization at the individual level. So this concept is known as the niche variation hypothesis. And so I'll just run you through this um, relatively quickly here. So if we go to the left, you've got this niche axis and then this resource use frequency and this large top peak that's showing here is the population level. So this is the niche of the population, but it's made up of many individuals. And these are uh, essentially generalists that we're showing here. However, as resource uh, use or resource availability changes, so you get increased resource availability, you can have the expansion of that uh, trophic niche. And this can happen in one of two ways. It can either happen by uh, all individuals in the population expanding their trophic niche, or it can occur because you have individuals in that population that are specializing on different diet types. So uh, we wanted to do this uh, looking at this raptor guild and just to reintroduce them, we've got the jeer falcon, which is this non-migratory species, uh, generally considered a, a specialist on um, ptarmigan, but it's more of a facultative specialist because our study has shown that they're, they're feeding on Arctic ground squirrels a lot. Uh, then you've got a real generalist species here, the golden eagle, uh, and then you've got this real specialist species, uh, rough-legged hawks that are feeding on those arvicolian rodents. So when you have a, a abundance of voles and uh, lemmings, you get a lot of breeding uh, rough-legged hawks because they're specialized on them. When there's not a lot of them available, you get very low breeding densities. Uh, but the question is, those few animals that are still breeding, are they still specializing on these arvicolian rodents? Uh, so this is uh, generally what our data sets uh, looked like. Again, it was opportunistically ob obtained. So the sampling coverage is very different across the species. Uh, and for example, in the case of rough-legged hawks, we've only got two years of data and only 11 nests. Uh, whereas from uh, geofalcon, we've got five years of data and 40 nests and uh, similar for the, the golden eagles. 
So uh, jumping into uh, the isotope results. Uh, so what you see here are um, uh, essentially an isotopic map. And um, uh, this is showing a standard ellipses uh, for the different species. So in red, we've got the, the golden eagle. In green, we've got the gyro falcon. And then in blue, we've got the rough-legged hawks. So if we look at the area of those standard ellipses, it's largest for the golden eagle, uh, which is what you'd expect the generalist to have the largest um, uh, standard ellipse for an isotope. Uh, the gyro falcon, the facultative specialist in the middle, and then smallest for the rough-legged hawk, uh, the specialist species. And then um, let's look at uh, two years of data where we have data in all species, 2018 and 2019. In 2018 was a, a low arvicolin rodent a year versus 2019 uh, is a high. And so tenfold higher. And we know this because we were putting out uh, snap traps to collect prey for isotopes. And uh, we we're catching more than 10 times as many in 2019 versus 2018. And if we look at this, well, uh, it didn't have a big effect on golden eagles. Uh, they're not feeding on arvicolin rodents, uh, which is what we expected, uh, but there's a, a little bit of a, a shift in diet between years. Uh, you can see that the gyro falcons are, were eating more arvicolin rodents. And then our specialist here is uh, feeding primarily on those arvicolin rodents in 2019, uh, but has a, a much more varied diet in 2018 uh, when they're at uh, low numbers. Okay, now let's get to that niche variation hypothesis. So how does uh, the level of individual specialization uh, change with uh, the, the population level niche? So we're estimating the population level niche here using the total isotopic niche width uh, using these uh, stable isotope ellipse areas. And then uh, we're using this metric of individual specialization which is based on the diet composition estimated uh, for um, each nest in the population. And what we see here is for gyro falcon, um, we, we get an increase in specialization uh, with an increase in isotopic niche width. Uh, but when you do this, you also have to run a, a null model as well because um, as uh, the, the niche width increases, uh, just through random sampling, you're going to get an increase in, um, in specialization. So what we're comparing here is actually the slopes between these two lines. And it seems like this slope might be steeper, but we don't have a lot of data and we don't have a uh, significant support for the niche variation hypothesis. So it looks like this might be the case, but we can't say that um, based on the limited years of data that we have. Uh, for golden eagles, uh, things were uh, a little bit uh, surprising in that for animals across all years, or almost all years, they are substantially um, more generalist than you would expect by chance. And so we're not sure if this has a, a biological explanation. So one possibility is that these, these different prey types have different temporal niches. And if golden eagles are essentially sampling uh, across a wider range of temporal niches, that's gonna force them th to have a more diverse diet than expected by chance. So that's one possibility. Uh, another possibility is that essentially we might not be accurately uh, reflecting the diet uh, with the golden eagles based on the stable isotope data. And the concern here is that it's really difficult with stable isotopes uh, to account for animals that have many, many sources. And so if there's a source we missed for golden eagles, or um, it, it, it could be that just our, our, those peaks are, are sort of broader in our estimates, we might not be accurately estimating diet for these animals. So we couldn't actually, and in the end, answer this question uh, based on the stable isotopes, but we could address it uh, with gyro falcon in a second way using those nest cameras. And uh, the nest cameras we have more years of data for, 
uh, because uh, they were putting them out uh, in years where they were not collecting blood samples uh, initially. And so we can address that niche variation hypothesis using the camera data. And what you can see here is that there's a significant difference uh, between the, the slope of uh, this line versus the null model. And so uh, these animals are increasingly specializing in years where the, um, the population niche is widest. And so that's um, consistent with the niche variation hypothesis. So looking at those slopes of the lines can be a little bit confusing. What does this mean? Essentially, when you have a, a broad um, array of prey available, what Gear Falcon are doing is they, the population has um, a pretty wide niche, but individuals, and, and I keep saying individuals, but really it's individual nests because we're, we're measuring all prey going into a single nest, so it's two individuals that create this, but these individual nests uh, are often quite specialized. And so you've got these specialists that are feeding on just ptarmigan, specialists that are feeding predominantly on ground squirrels, uh, we've got a specialist here, we didn't have very many of these, but that are feeding on uh, gulls and Jaegers. And then another specialist here, or a, a real generalist here that's got uh, arvicol and rodents, uh, ptarmigan and ground squirrels almost equally. So uh, why is this important? Well, it's important to think about this in terms of how changes in prey availability are gonna influence these populations uh, because they're gonna have uh, greater influence on particular individuals within that population. Um, and it, it could promote uh, population stability under um, uh, dynamic uh, environmental conditions if you have a lot of different specialists in your population. Okay, so uh, the conclusions for this final section, um, we saw that um, uh, Arctic raptor niche space overlaps more than previously documented. And I kind of forgot to talk about that in that initial slide, but there's a, a fair bit of overlap within that Arctic raptor guild. And so uh, there, there's a lot of overlap uh, among prey and they're not substantially partitioning. Or there, there is partitioning occurring, but there's more overlap than predicted. Uh, these arvicolian rodent cycles are, are influencing uh, niche use. And then uh, it's important to consider these level of individual specialization uh, when thinking about uh, impacts of things like climate change. And so with that, I'll take any questions. Oh. Well, hopefully this is still working. Hi, that was a really fun seminar. I really enjoyed it. Um, I've done a little stable isotope work in the past and um, it's just really fascinating to see what you're finding. Um, you mentioned that you're seeing differences between um, age classes. Do you see, or do you think you'd see differences among um, uh, sexes, depending on the species? Um, would that be something to consider? Um, and, and also, is it possible that you can differentiate fledglings from adults using this approach, or would you really have to design a whole new study to look at fledgling diet? Uh, so I think, yeah, looking at fledglings versus adults. So I think once the animals are, are fully grown, um, trophic discrimination should be relatively similar um, among individuals. So, you know, if you talk about sex differences, uh, we didn't see any among the nestlings in this study. Uh, so we looked at that and um, because we had, you know, many nestlings within a nest, uh, we had really good data to look at that. And, and that had no effect. Y you might see that in situations where, you know, I, I think something like a pinniped where, you know, males are like putting on a lot more mass than females that could potentially influence 
trophic discrimination. Um, for fledglings versus adults, if you can catch them repeatedly, um, you could potentially use that. Um, so you're going to have to be concerned a little bit with turnover rates um, because you, they're going to need to be like, once they reach full size, then you're going to want them to have like fully turned over that tissue before you sample them again, if you're going to use a, a similar trophic discrimination factor. But I, I think it's an approach you could use. Thanks. So Corey, there's a question from Dr. Allen and he is wondering how much stable isotope ratios might vary by tissue type. And is this an issue with these types of studies? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. Uh, so it does vary by tissue types. And um, I think you have to really consider your tissues carefully. So a lot of groups use plasma as a tissue, for example, and um, plasma has a much more rapid turnover rate. And so you can sort of compare like short-term versus long-term, but I would always discourage the use of plasma because it can be, you know, it's a transport tissue. So it can really be affected by time since last meal. Um, if you've just taken up a, um, you know, a bet on something, you've taken up a bunch of amino acids that are now, you know, essentially directly from the diet in your bloodstream. If you have uh, a lot of lipids in the diet uh, or in the bloodstream from the diet, that can really skew those plasma results. Uh, and you definitely need to calculate specific TDFs for each tissue, because um, it's going to be variable. And then there are other things to consider. Um, if you're looking at a tissue that's fatty, you're probably going to want to um, uh, extract the lipids and, and measure it without the lipids. Uh, lipids are depleted uh, in uh, carbon-13 uh, relative to non-lipid. Uh, and so there, there are, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things that to consider when you're thinking about um, tissue selection. So I had a quick question, Corey. Do you see um, another way to apply these TDFs if you're not able to use to compare with um, cameras per se? and diet? Yeah, so I, I think there's other possibilities of developing like the same approach. Um, for example, you can get really accurate measures of diet using um, DNA from fecal matter. And so if you, if you have certain individuals where you get a lot of um, repeat samples, of that DNA across a time that's consistent with isotopic incorporation, and you can estimate diet, you could potentially develop trophic discrimination factors in, in a similar manner. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to think of other systems where you can get you know, such highly accurate data as you can with a, a, an S camera. Okay, anybody else have a question or are you all saving it for the seminar discussion afterwards? If so, Connor did post that link in the chat. Anybody else have a question? I don't see anything coming up. All right, thanks everyone. Okay, we'll take a little break. Corey, if you wanna take a quick break and then um, Join us here in the um, Zoom. Um, we see that password discussion in the chat, and then we'll field questions from graduate students for a short while here. Thanks, that everyone. Thanks, Corey. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Corey. I'll keep this open until you get that the link so that I don't close it before you lose it. Thanks. <laughs>